Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. There's a worldwide crisis developing, and the culprit is plastic. By 2050, there'll be more plastic in the world's oceans than fish. There's already a great garbage patch floating between California and Hawaii that is three times as large as France. Plus, over 80% of the world's tap water tested positive for microplastic. That's really frightening because the chemicals in plastics aren't widely studied and we don't know what they do to our bodies. Some scientists suspect they're connected to fertility problems and illnesses like breast and prostate cancer. All this is a massive bummer, but people, even governments across the world are fighting back. Will it be enough? On the one hand, plastics are great. They're relatively cheap, so products that use the material, everything from cars and homes to computers and cameras, are more affordable for consumers. Plus, plastics have paved the way for a number of important medical breakthroughs. On the other hand, however, 40% of plastics are single use. Things like straws, cups, utensils, and takeout containers that are maybe in use for a few minutes before being thrown away. Actually, away is sort of misleading. Plastic isn't biodegradable, so it doesn't rot and disappear like foods. It can actually survive for hundreds of years, clogging up places like landfills, bodies of water, sewer systems, and really anywhere the wind blows. Worse, animals frequently consume plastic. That sucks because it's a shitty way for animals to die, and it also makes the human food chain less safe. It was completely legal to dump plastic in the ocean until the 90s, and a lot of that plastic is still there because plastic lasts out there for a very long time. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Keep in mind, 91% of plastics are not recycled, although some countries are better than others. Germany is the world leader in recycling. The US is 25th best. Now, it's important to note a lot of countries don't do their own recycling. They ship their plastic to Asian countries where it's then processed and reused. Or at least that's the theory. Sometimes it just gets burnt. However, China recently announced it would no longer be the world's dump site. So countries that have failed to invest adequately in their recycling infrastructure, places like the US, are scrambling for a solution or shipping their recyclable items to other places in Southeast Asia. There's also the issue of what is leaking into our food and water from plastic containers. John Wargo, a professor of environmental health at Yale, told me there are thousands of chemicals used in plastics that are untested. The chemical industry has lobbied hard to prevent these potentially hazardous materials from being studied. As an aside, while researching this piece, I noticed that pro-plastic articles and studies funded by the plastic industry were often listed as the top Google results. Kind of creepy and a reminder to check your sources. Anyway, Wargo said there's no conclusive evidence that the rise in plastic has contributed to the rise of many preventable diseases, but he thought it was a valid line of inquiry, one that governments in particular have a responsibility to investigate. After all, the overwhelming majority of cancers are caused by behavioral and environmental problems. Academics, meanwhile, are also trying to understand why people don't recycle and what could be done to encourage it. Professor Remy Trudell, a behavioral economist at Boston University, conducted a series of experiments on recycling. Two interesting takeaways emerged. One, if recyclable items are damaged, say a can that is bent out of shape or even paper scraps that are cut up, people are less likely to recycle them. We tend to classify imperfect things as broken. Broken things go in the trash, not the recycling bin. Trudell calls this a distortion bias. Second discovery. People are more likely to recycle something that has their name on it, a cup from Starbucks with Lou scribbled across it, for example. We identify with the cup because it has our name on it, hence we treat it with more care. Consistent with that finding, if your name is spelled incorrectly, you are less likely to recycle it. There's less of a connection. Interestingly, Trudeau told me this identification bias works with more than just our names. Products that have brand logos or institutions we identify with are harder for us to throw out. Perhaps that's why so many of us hold on to school t-shirts for a really long time. But I digress. Trudell thinks these insights about recycling decisions can inform design choices that make it easier for consumers to do the right thing. The Share a Coke campaign, with folks' names written on the side of the can, sort of accidentally achieved this effect. Now, there's another school of thought that recycling has actually contributed to the plastic crisis. It's fostered a clean it up later mentality that has allowed people to think the overuse of plastics isn't a problem. We'll just recycle. 
So, a new approach has emerged. Governments across the world are enacting policies designed to curb plastic consumption. Plastic bags, the type you get at a supermarket and likely use just once, are a big target. In Kenya, plastic bags are illegal, and violators can be jailed up to four years. Other countries, like the UK, have imposed small fees for using plastic bags. These fees are minuscule, like five pence, so they're more of a reminder than anything else. It's sort of symbolic. But it's actually worked. A study concluded that about an 80% reduction in carrier bags, that's what plastic bags are called in England, contributed to a sharp decline in plastic bags found on the seafloor surrounding the country. Some cities, like Seattle, have targeted plastic straws. Other municipalities have banned microplastics in cosmetics, like face scrubs and toothpaste. These plastics are so small, they slip right past filters and into the water supply. The beads soak up pesticides and chemicals after they're washed down the drain. Big fish eat little fish. Eventually the fish is on your dinner plate and you're eating that fish along with all the toxins that have been consumed along the way. Little footnote here. When big municipalities adopt new policies, that often forces manufacturers to implement the new changes everywhere. I mean, if you're a beauty company, you can't have a different face scrub for every city you operate in. So you'll roll out a new face scrub that abides by the strictest rules, even in places that don't ban microplastics. This is referred to as the California effect. The basic idea, California is so big, change there reverberates in many other places. And in fact, California has rolled out many regulations designed to slow plastic consumption. Another footnote, as with so many problems, People think technology will save us from plastic pollution. Some companies are working on robotic systems that sort through a pile of trash and put aside the things that should be recycled. Then there are these giant wheels in places like Baltimore that suck up floating trash. Perhaps more exciting, scientists in the UK accidentally created an enzyme that naturally digests plastic. Still not really usable at this point, but exciting. However, why wait for technology to maybe save us when the solution is so simple? Dr. Scott Hardy, an educator at the Ohio Sea Grant Program, told me that a survey he conducted in the Cleveland area showed that most consumers support bans or extra fees on things like plastic bags. But the number one reason they continue to use them anyway, they forget to bring a reusable option. They leave the reusable bag at home or in the trunk of their car. That's why Hardy encourages grocery stores to post reminders in their parking lots. Education, he said, is also key. It's important to remind consumers that the things they use, even the things they think they're recycling, often wind up polluting our environment. Look, I'm as prone to laziness and forgetfulness as the next short-sighted consumer, but we clearly need to change our relationship to single-use plastic. So here's hoping that the use of reusable bottles and wooden utensils and paper straws increase, that we all remember to bring our environmentally friendly tote into the grocery store. Granted, change may be less convenient and more expensive in the short term. These environmentally friendly options are frequently pricier and harder to find. But you have to keep in mind the long-term cost of not changing. An ocean with more plastic than fish isn't something you or your grandkids can pay your way out of. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life. Earth is such a beautiful planet, and yet we have, us humans that is, have such a magnificent way of f***ing it all up.